Okay, hello everyone. My name is Michael Downey and as host of today's session, I'm very pleased to welcome you to today's AWRI webinar. Today's session will discuss best practice methods for managing soil structure in established vineyards. And I'm very fortunate to have with me Andy Clark, whose findings from his Nuffield scholarship will guide the conversation for the session. Andy is the viticulturist at Yering Station in the Yarra Valley and a 2015 Nuffield scholar. Uh, this scholarship saw Andy visit France, Germany, Spain, China, Canada, and the US explorers, exploring various agricultural industries. Andy has significant viticultural experience in the Yarra Valley as well as experience across South Australia in both winery and viticulture roles. So it's fantastic to have Andy with us, but I also invite you, the audience, to join today's conversation. To ask a question, please open the Q&A section of the webinar, type in your question and click to send. A Q&A will be held following Andy's presentation. If you'd like to get involved through Twitter, please use the Twitter handle at the underscore AWRI. Uh, the webinar is being recorded and will be available to view later this afternoon from, this, from the AWRI's YouTube channel. Now, I'd also like to thank and acknowledge Wine Australia for providing support and funding for AWRI webinars. And for anyone that's just joined us, welcome. The topic for today's session is managing soil structure in established vineyards. And I'll hand over now to our presenter to start the conversation. Thank you, Michael. Um, thank you, thank you, Michael. Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, just, I'd like to reiterate some of the points that Michael's raised. Um, I want to just acknowledge the fact that AWRI do provide this platform for us to, to share findings, not just from uh, practitioners, but researchers alike. Um, I would like to thank uh, Nuffield Australia for the opportunity to, to explore the world of soil science and, and pro providing an open and honest network for, for this, this research to, to occur. Um, I'd also like to thank Wine Australia um, for the ongoing sponsorship of Nuffield Scholars. Um, it's an excellent opportunity for, for building the, the human capital of the industry on, a, on an international platform and also Yearing Station for, for supporting me through this also. Uh, just briefly, the, the, the Nuffield um, program is, is uh, it's an international agricultural leadership program which involves 16 weeks of travel to, to research your, your topic of choice um, with others and you'd spend half that time with, with scholars from, from around the world and then half the time traveling solo. So, so my, my topic was the, the management of, of soil structure in established vineyards. As part of that, you, you'll meet with anyone from from senators through to trade delegations, researchers, farmers from, from any variety of industries. And my question was always, um, you know, how, how do you manage your soil within your businesses? And generally what we're doing in Australia in a lot of, a lot of cases is, is quite relevant to, to best practice. Um, obviously the fact that the conditions that we do tend to operate in in Australian agriculture are uh, are quite challenging compared to other parts of the world. Um, so we we're pretty well on track in that regard, but I'd also, also ask them the, what sort of challenges that their businesses were facing within, within agriculture and, and generally the same answers had come back and pretty similar to what we're experiencing, experiencing as well. So it's, you know, it's, it's soil, it's access to market, it's rising energy costs, it's access to secure water, and, and the overriding factor in amongst all of that was, was people. So it was, it was access to labour and, and rising labour costs. So, so people just kept sh showing up and how I went through this, this process. So with, with the, the Australian wine industry, I mean, obviously we have diverse geographical locations. We have, um, you know, as, as these maps show, we we'll, um, obviously different climatic conditions within that, huge variability in soils. Um, also, I mean, the, the map on the right is, is purely geared around 
a very macroscopic pH scale of, of Australian soils. And that, that shows the diversity, but then when you break it down into a, a regional perspective or, or even a, you know, everyone knows their own vineyards and, and their own blocks, that, that changes a huge amount as well. One general overlying thing with our soils is they're generally you know, old, fragile, they're highly weathered. Um, so they're, they're, whilst they take so long to build up, they, they can degrade very, very quickly. So in a lot of ways, they're, they're a little bit like building trust um, in any relationship that you might have, whether it's with your, your, your staff, your, your labour, your, your clients or the like. You, you put a lot of time into doing the right thing by it, but one poor decision can make everything unravel, unravel very quickly. So we have to be very conscious of that in how we actually manage our systems. So obviously vineyard development is the best time for remedial work. Um, it's, it's easy to do. You don't have infrastructure in the way. Um, so you've got a vast array of equipment that, that's at your disposal to, to do that. Now, it's also the best time to manage the soil chemistry and as, as, the, as the structure of the soil with that as well. You know, they've got access to ripping and, and spreading and the like. But the problem is uh, in Australia, we have the oldest plantings of vines in the world. Um, and compared to many other areas in the world, the average vine age doesn't get anywhere even close to what we're, we experience with some of our century old plantings and the like. The average age of a vineyard in the Napa Valley is only between 17 and 20 years. And they expect to be pulling out and starting again due to other inherent issues they have through disease or virus or, or, or biosecurity risks. So we're, we have a different paradigm we have to work in, in in regards to that. This means we have to, to um, explore other ways around our, our issues. Now, over time, the, the intensive nature of vineyard management will lead to, to soil structural degradation. Um, and, and this will have an impact on, on uh, reducing the vine's productivity and therefore its ability to deal, deal with um, extreme climatic changes. Once this, this structure is compromised, it, it can be very, very difficult to, to, uh, to rectify. So, The traditional European methods don't work on our soils as our soils are so different. Um, the example on the, on the left, that's uh, Corton Charlemagne in, uh, in Burgundy. Um, clearly their soils are, are very different to certainly what we have in the Yarra Valley or, or in a lot of soil examples in, in, uh, in the rest of Australia where their, their soils are a lot younger, They've, their, their structure is completely different. Um, I actually met with, this is uh, Emmanuel Bergignon, who's one of his family, are some of the leading um, biodynamic and biological researchers and, and, and consultants within the, the French wine industry based out of Burgundy. I was having a discussion with him and he was, he was one of the, the few to actually really understand this. I mean, Emmanuel had actually spent a lot of time studying in in New Zealand and, and had spent some time in Australia and he just said to me, well, your soils are, your soils are different, so you, should, you can't do what we need, what we do. So it was sort of, it was at that point that of all the things that, that you sort of observe and you understand as you, as you go along, um, it's when you start having discussions with people who are seeing things through the same paradigm that you, that you really begin to, to understand what's, what's, uh, you're on the same page. So with that in mind, I, I sort of, in a, in a bit of reflection and, and soul searching, I, I, um, I found that it's, it's able to break soil structure down into, into three categories, or what I call the three Ps, pores, plants, and people. Now pores relates to the, to the physical structure and, and the soil chemistry. chemistry. So this is 
this is like the lungs of the soil. This is where the air pathways are and, and, and how it actually allows, allows your soil to, to breathe, so to speak. And, I, and I'll talk about these as a, a bit, bit like a, a, the human anatomy is, is it's the soil as one is a, is a living organism. So the plants are the, the biology of the soil. Uh, that's, so that's the, the, the plant roots, it's the microorganisms and any other organisms that, that do live within that soil environment. Um, and these are what not only create the channels within the soil, but they'll also, they become the binding, binding mechanisms for it also. So this is, this is almost like the soil's musculoskeletal system. And the people is the, is the decision making. It's the farmer, it's and how we as custodians learn and, uh, and adapt to the soil as, as we understand it greater and greater over time. So this is almost like the, the brain of the agricultural ecosystem. So, so together, these three Ps, they all, they all interrelate. And what we're sort of trying to do is, is get to that, that sort of point in the centre where with a positive outcome. Because obviously, any of these, whilst they can... They can have a positive impact, they can also have a negative impact as well. So, so we just have to be really mindful of that. With that in mind also, people, us as farmers, viticulturalists, winemakers, the, the, the custodians of it, we have, we're, we're really shaping this and we have a, a huge amount of power over it. So in discussing the pores, um, this is the, in the physical structure and the, and the soil chemistry. So as part of this, and we're talking about whether it's the, the mineral components, it's whether it's the clay or, or sandy or soils, whatever particle, mineral particles you have in the soil, but also the water and the air. So it's, um, it's, almost, it's as much about the spaces in between them as it is the, the particles themselves. So the ideal structure is optimising no matter what sort of soil type you have, it's, it's optimising those spaces and the, and the structure and the ability for, the, for any plant or, or microorganism to actually grow in it. So in terms of the physical management of, of these pores, you're, sort of, you're looking at cultivation. Um, the example below is, is a lovely cultivated headland in, in, uh, um, in Spain, in La Mancha. Um, I'm not sure we'd really see that too often in, in the Australian situations, but, but um, and, and rightfully so, as it's, it's generally not ideal on a regular basis within our soils due to the destruction of, of, of our soil aggregates. And that's not saying you, you don't ever use it. There's obviously occasional needs that you may need to do it to, to open your soil up or, or you know, whether you're levelling rows to remove ruts and, th and things like that. But, but if it's used on a, on a consistent basis and regularly, it can be detrimental, not just to the, the aggregates, but you know, removing soil organic matter as, as it allows for the oxidation of, of, of the, uh, the carbon that's within the soil. And it also exposes the soil to, to a lot of erosion activities, so whether it's through rainfall, but then also dispersion and slaking and, and crusting and the like. So it's, it's it needs to be used quite judiciously, I think. Um, now, that, that also leads to, to compaction issues that we can have due to the, the high traffic areas that we do tend to have in vineyards. Um, a lot of the broadacre guys now with the use of GPS and the like um, are able to use travel rows within their vineyard, uh, within their uh, broadacre situations to to minimise compaction on on their on their fields um, with really high returns in productivity. Um, the fact that we tend to have to to drive our rows a lot more and the intensive nature means that this isn't as readily available to us. There are some uh, multi-row tools and such as sprayers and the like that that can be used, um, and they're certainly beneficial and should be used where possible. Um, but it's but we still have the capacity to reduce our traffic, and particularly on on wet soils that can lead to to compaction and and closing up those those pores um, and reducing that the, the structure and 
and the like. Um, so as a result, deep, deep ripping can be utilised to, to minimise this, um, these effects, breaking up these compaction layers, but, but it's not going to last for huge amounts of time. I know there has been considerable research done in regards to this, um, and a lot of our, our soils, the, the plastic nature of them, particularly the, the sort of heavier clays, subsoils, and even some of the, the clay topsoils, um, you can put all the, the horsepower into it to bust it up that you like, but as soon as you drive over it with a spray cart at the start of spring when the soils are damp, it's, the majority of it will just close back up and that work won't be done. Um, likewise, there's been works done with uh, injecting compost down into these rip lines as well. Um, but as the, the soil closes up over the top, it's, it's very difficult for, for oxygen to get into these areas and, and it actually sits there in an anaerobic state and minimises the, any potential benefits from it. Uh, ameliorants used to, to manage this, the, the, the pores generally centres around gypsum and lime, um, adding cations, calcium to, to manage salinity Sedicity and also correct um, acidic pHs. Um, now, the higher amounts of larger cations, and particularly the, particularly calcium, can lead to or lead to higher aggregate stability, and that gives you a stronger base to, to build your, your soil structure. Um, calcium also replaces replaces the the weaker bonds formed by by sodium within within the soil, which means that they will then be leached out. It just means that you need to have a um, provision for removing the sodium from, from the soil, whether it be through irrigation or, or rainfall, and sometimes drains might be required in that sense. So throughout, throughout this, uh, my research, I came upon um, an opportunity with a, a German-based company called CHT. Uh, for decades, their, their core business has been geared around the production of fabric softeners for the textiles industry and, and other super super wetting agents. Um, some of their products have been have gone into um, wetters used for, for agriculture um, prior to most you know, new modern technology having built in wetting agents within them. So um, I spoke to them in regards to uh, this technology and under, and in October 2016, we undertook a trial on, on our site, which is pictured here, um, and also another site with a vegetable grower in, in Victoria. Um, so we utilised their, their cationic organosilicate technology. Um, this was applied as a once-off, relatively small dose to the soil. Um, and utilising this wetter, which is it's a derivative of, of silicon of sand, um, my aim was to, to improve the, the vertical movement of water and irrigation during summer as the soils in this area tend to be um, quite high in, in bulk density and with the aim of moving it deeper into the soil and helping us through through heat spells and getting more water use efficiency. Um, there was a slight change in the water movement but we're sort of we're still yet to, to fully gauge that but what we did find is is the cationic nature of this compound, um, which is exponentially larger than any calcium cation, has the ability to release significant amounts of sodium from the soil. So if you look at, look at this image and where the, the headland runs through the middle of the property, you can see there's a sort of almost a triangular um, bronzing colour through the, through the block. So this is, this is Shiraz on own roots. Um, and that bronzing is, is sodium uptake into the into the vine. Now, obviously not ideal, um, but it's, it'll be interesting to see this this year uh, as to whether or not that sodium is now leached out of the soil. So there's, there's a huge, potentially a huge um, benefit in treating sodic soils in the future with this product. Um, additionally, once that was actually treated, you were very, it was very easy to push a shovel in underneath the drippers. Um, the, the valve next to it, it's all in the same block. Uh, you'd struggle to push a penetrometer into the soil, let alone a shovel. So it certainly softened the soil. Um, and now the proof of concept's been through. Um, we have 
trials now undergoing with with Monash University and the like to 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 really get a full understanding of of what it is. So, what's this space on on that product? Uh, as I mentioned, we have do tend to have high bulk density in some of our soils on the Yarra floor. Um, this is actually the neighbouring property to the, the one we just saw. Um, so in 2014, we removed the delves from these rows. This is actually my problem child vineyard, I'm happy to admit it. Um, and we dished and power harrowed to sort of to flatten it out before sowing with a cover crop with quite heavy delves. Um, we had a very dry autumn uh, and it was sown just prior to a, to a rainfall event. The rainfall then became perched. Uh, the soil proved to be quite hydrophobic. Um, we ran into issues with serious water logging and, and then this led to, to failed germination. So this isn't long after, the photo on the left isn't long after sowing. Um, and a lot of that germination that is visible pretty much died shortly afterwards. Um, in the spring of 2015, uh, we actually, this same vineyard, we applied uh, a product called Transformer, which is an orange oil extract. So the idea is that it reduce, reduce the water tension and allow for, for better percolation of water through the soil, um, applied through the drip, it was 10 litres at a hectare. Uh, the image on the right is from later in that season, uh, I think it was mid-March. So this is, this is all young, young vines, Shiraz on 101.14 broodstock. Um, now, this isn't post-harvest because the vines on the right actually shortly after Verazon just started to completely shut down. Um, so all fruit was, was stripped from the vines, weren't gonna, didn't wanna push the vines too hard. So um, the, the vines on the left in that actually were treated. So you can see that there was a huge amount of difference in the vine's ability to actually manage, manage the season um, in that regard. What we also found, and I, and I can actually find the photos of it, but these are, these are two separate irrigation valves. The, just under each vine, there's, there's, there's sort of like a basin um, below each vine. And we found that we'd had water perching in these basins. As I said, it's hydrophobic soil um, during any significant irrigation event, uh, which actually didn't even have to be significant. But very quickly, water would start to puddle underneath these, these vines in the, in the basins. Um, where it was treated, the, the water was flowing straight through the soil. Um, and you'd have water perch for at least an hour post irrigation on the right hand side. So we found that we're getting much better movement of water down into the soil um, and subsequent digs um, with excavators, the thing we've actually now been able to move water deep, uh, roots deeper into the soil as well. Uh, the topsoil is probably 40 to 60 centimetres before it goes into the heavy plastic clays and we're actually found on the, the treated area we're now getting roots down into that lower clay, whereas on the on the right, we're still well short of it. So it certainly had an effect in being able to get things moving down through that through those pores. So in terms of plants, uh, I guess most people are familiar with the soil food web and the diversity of biology within the soil. See the few, not only plant roots, but You've got fungi, bacteria, earthworms, and everything in, in between that play their role in, in, in the soil food web and binding aggregates, and they create channels for, for plant root, plant roots, water, and, and air movement. Um, much, of the, much of this carbon regeneration within the, the soil food web originates from, from plant, root, plant root exudates feeding, feeding this system. So, uh, Rick. Rick Haney here, uh, he's from the USDA in Texas, um, and along with other, many other researchers have, have found that the most um, productive systems are the ones that incorporate cover crops. Now, obviously it's not anything new to, to viticulture, but um, even in broadacre systems now, they're really promoting 
having that living root system within the soil. Um, the soils become more resilient, they're able to handle extremes better. Um, and Rick's actually, he's devised a method of, of quickly measuring respiration in dry soils once they get, uh, they have the addition of water. So he thinks, he believes that, that the soil's ability to, to respond to this quick influx of, of stimulus of favorable conditions like, like rainfall, um, within that soils with the, the highest product, potential productivity um, are those with the quickest and most sustained respiration response. So he, he's actually tested it against you know, scorched earth or, or heavily tilled um, systems. And they found that in those, in those systems, the, the respiration response is far slower. So it comes back to having, um, having living roots for as long as you possibly can within your, your vineyard system. And that's not necessarily the mid row, but that's also under vinyl. Also. So plants are, are crucial to the stability of, of, of pores within, within Australian soil. So, you know, you speak with, with Rob Murray or, or, or Alf Cass or Emmanuel Bergignon from earlier, and they all believe that sort of structure tends to be the major limiting factor in, within Australian soils. And the plants, permanent root systems are the, are the things that sort of can prevent the soils from coalescing or, or, or packing down into these uh, complete plastic messes in, in some situation. Um, so in order to, to facilitate um, the movement of vine roots down into the soil in, in some of our blocks in the Yarra Valley, we've actually used tillage radish. Um, now, the same block that I showed earlier with it, that had the, the hydrophobic soils, the, the following year we planted in, in uh, the autumn of 2015 with, with tillage radish, which is the example on the left. So you can see the, the, the short stubby radish on the far left. Um, the ground was so hard, even though it was, we'd, again, We'd had a break in the season, we got it in, but the soil, the moisture couldn't penetrate into the soil. So it actually pushed down into the soil, only that's about an, an inch. Um, and then the taproot actually started growing laterally because it didn't have the capacity to push down through that harder soil, even though technically that's what people utilize chilies radish for. Um, what we found was they were actually pushing themselves aerially out of the ground. So you can see the top of the radish is sort of, it's the actual tuber itself is, is half out of the soil. Um, on some cultivated ground in the same year, that, that's a radish next to it that has been able to push itself straight down. Um, what I've found is that with uh, self-germinating uh, radishes that are particularly well done it in young vines uh, and found that they'll start pushing up in the, uh, under a dripper, such as the image on the right, the big, the big boy, the big fat one. Um, there's plenty of nutrient, there's plenty of water and they'll, they'll go, go like the clappers, but um, and you can see they've got a huge potential to, to push out both laterally and, and vertically. Even that, um, that radish with, with plenty of water and nutrient is still only pushing in maybe 25 to 30 centimetres before it wants to push aerially out of the ground again. So, but it did, it did get me thinking about what we, what we can do. So obviously we we're sort of, I think we all probably familiar with the fact that if you've in heavier soils, if you've got um, moisture content, you can, the, the soil isn't as hard. So end of the season last year, I went and gave a large uh, irrigation in these same blocks. Um, again in the young vines trying to, to break open the soil and allow them to, to really push through and, and chase some of these um, open openings within the soil. Um, I wet the soil as much as I possibly could before, before seeding so that it was able for these roots to actually go vertically rather than having the example on the left where they're only going X amount um, and then starting to go lateral before the soils had a chance to, 
to soften up through through winter rains. That's something just to be to be mindful of when using these sorts of things. But but the the roots the the root systems that we have are, are sort of crucial in being able to open up the pores. Now whether it's the big system like that or whether it's fibrous ryegrass, that all of them play their part play their role and the more diverse the root systems we can produce the the better we are set up for, for going forward now obviously we have other tools for in this biological space that the compost in adding stable car, stable car, form of carbon is excellent um, in aiding in the, the aggregate strength and porosity though for maximum effect on the soil it actually should be incorporated. So that's again, something that's probably better in that establishment phase for a pure um, soil stability perspective. Um, now mulch, so straw mulch and, and the like is, is much less stable um, as it'll break down over a far shorter time. So it's used more for water moisture retention as, as compost often is. Um, However, the breakdown process of, of mulch actually releases humus, more humus into the soil than, than compost. So in that process, it actually, from what I can understand, um, is probably almost more beneficial in, in creating stable aggregates because it's that humic compound that, that will, will aid in building those aggregates. So it's, it's pretty wide. There's a, there's a clear correlation between plants and pores and, and they both sort of rely very heavily on, on one another. So then I'll come to the third P and, and people. And when I was in, I, I visited with, with Bob Schindelbeck at um, Cornell University in, in New York State. And Bob actually presented on the the Cornell Soil Health Program, the tech conference in 2011, I believe. Um, and it was with meeting with Bob that I, I really started to understand that soil science is as much sociologic, sociological as it is technical. Um, you know, our decision making is critical in how we manage soil and, and, and you know, this is something that we often don't take into consideration when, when just getting our, our tests done. So as part of their soil health program, they have a whole range of a suite of tests and, and as part of that, they actually do a, conduct an interview with the, the farmers. So they wanna see what sort of paradigm the farmer's working from. So along with all the standard tests that we've got available to us in, within Australia, they've, by looking at these this interview, they can actually shape their their program to suit them and whatever that's congruent with them. Um, you know, they want to know if they're just following the practices of what their their generations prior have done, or or whether they're um, you know, financially strapped or or the like. Because they, realistically, if they were to put put forward a plan to to a grower, that um, it's great for long term stability of the soil or, or productivity, but it's, it's got a high initial uh, investment cost. The, the farmer's just gonna completely look at it and, and shut it down if he knows that um, there's a risk that the bank's gonna take his property off him next year. So they've gotta be very careful, but it, but it all, this sets it up for, for success so much more. So much more. Um, the, we need to, oh, sorry, there, there's, some, there's somewhere in the vicinity of probably around $35 million worth of government and industry funded research carried out in the, the Australian wine industry each year. Um, whether that's um, sort of open to interpretation, but um, th this essentially is a backbone of our understanding and our, and our building blocks for, for future technologies. And, and in Australia, it's available to all. You know, $35 million here. In the US, it's probably something like $3 million. Um, so it's, we're, we're quite fortunate to have organisations like, like the AWRI on our, to, to access these learnings. But there's also huge amounts of on-farm on learnings that we need to get better at, at sharing. So 
what what I find is that we need to be better at, at finding and acknowledging our, our regional champions, so whether that's in soil or some other part of the business. We, we need to really tap into these. You know, there could be people in the area like, like Rob Sutherland or, or Stuart Proud, and McLaren Vale could be Michael Lane or Toby Beckers and Prue Henschke and Eden Valley. Look, th these are just names that, that come to me. I'm sure everyone has people that they lean on and respect and, and, and the like. And, you know, they've been trialling some, any number of different things over the years and, and whether it's different methods or techniques or products, their learnings aren't just from the successes that they've had, but it's also from their failures also. So, you know, they, they'd, they'd be questioning it all the time. Was it, was it the technique that I used? Was it, was it poor timing? Was it the wrong seasonal conditions? You know, it's not dissimilar to, you know, what, what I've just discussed prior with, with some of our issues. It's, it's that con consistent learning that, that you have along the, the way. It's, it's knocking out the mistakes that you've made previously. Because if we're sharing these, we might help prevent somebody else from making the same problem or reinventing the wheel. Now, the issues that I faced, you know, some of those were, were due to inherent soil characteristics. Others were due to probably the fact that I'd power harrowed the, the soil to ground too fine. So I'd actually decimated the, the natural porosity of the soil. And and permitted the outcome to occur. Now we've hosted field days on that site not long after to discuss the challenges and, and of the block and you sort of, you know, it's funny how often when you start talking about these things that you see someone giving an, a, knowing, a knowing sort of nod when you're, when you're discussing the issue. And, and I know listening from, from listening to others talk that when you hear the mistakes they make along the way, that, you know, that's when you actually have the ability to, to cut an issue off at the past before you, you run into these problems. So these, these guys that we, you know, it's not so much putting them up on a pedestal, but it's just making sure that we're, we're nurturing those that, that have an understanding and they're doing these things and, and we're really creating networks around them um, that allow for for people to have the, the, the courage to display what, what's wrong as well as what is right within their farming system. Now, I guess the Irish, the Irish dairy industry um, have covered this on sort of on two fronts in some ways. So they, they've created discussion groups. I'm sorry, I'm flipping these around the other way, but the, they've discovered, they've created discussion groups. So they walk each other's farms. We have a, a group that could be anywhere between 10 to 12 farmers in, a, in, a, in an area. Um, and they walk each other's farms bi-monthly, uh, you know, one, one farm every two months they'll go to and, and they'll compare it, their operation, they'll look at their productivity, their, their quality counts, you name it, and they'll compare it to industry standards. And then they'll give feedback, they'll go away and they'll give feedback to the, the farm that they just walked on where they believe it can be improved. So it's almost like a, a mini advisory board. And I found these have been really successful. But the, the success of the group is linked to how open, how honest, and how vulnerable the, the members are willing to, willing to be. As feedback can, can, be, can bite pretty hard sometimes. And it, but if it's constructive and it's with the best intention and it's designed for the others to succeed, you can really pull the group along with you. Well, the other example is they, they sort of, they created a, a champion from scratch in some way. So they developed a greenfield dairy operation prior to the removal of milk quotas back in 2009. So prior to that, there was a cap on how much they could actually produce um, anywhere in the, in the EU. When that cap was lifted, they realised there was going to be a rush of people uh, moving into the dairy industry and uh, what they thought was that so there was the, the Irish Farmers Journal, and there was the uh, essentially the the industry board, so it'd be essentially what the equivalent of Wine Australia, and Glanby, a major producer and um, processor. They sort of got got together and, and built a dairy from scratch greenfield greenfield project. Um, because the Irish Farmers Journal 
so which is massive. We like the Weekly Times on steroids, I suppose, over there. They because they had a, a, a third stake in it. They were giving weekly updates of every part of the business, every operation, and they were able to have complete transparency of, of the business. So everybody could see where the shortcomings were in the business, where the pitfalls were, and either if they were established farmers, they could actually correct. They could see, okay, well that's not working over here either. So this is a better, this is the solution they found for it and correct their business. Or if they're a completely new business, they could actually um, eliminate any pitfalls before it even began. So there was a lot of changes that occurred with that. And it also actually led to um, changes in legislation because there was such transparency within it. So we've, we've covered off on pores, plants and people. Now, people is clearly the, the most, um, it's the most influential part of, of this system. We need to be very, um, we, need, we need to become more open and honest as, a, as farmers, I think as individuals, as companies, um, to be brave enough to, to share our, our failures and, and they're as important as our successes. I mean, when, when you have times of crisis, I suppose, um, the people that are, who you're going to lean upon or, or get greater learnings from are not the ones who have been gloating about the successes they've had in the record crops, but it's about the ones that, that know where, have been honest enough to, to share where they've had short failings in the past as well. And I see this as, as an opportunity, not competition. Um, as an industry, we are awesome at navel gazing. We think we have all the answers to everything. Um, probably because we're such a consumer facing industry, we're very brand focused. It's all about our own um, self image. So, you know, I think it's pretty fair to say that there's a, uh, they, they, well, what we do know is there are so many issues and um, variables in getting from a piece of soil through the growing season, through the production process in a winery, into the bottle to the consumer that um, if we're actually sharing our learnings in regards to how we manage our soil, how we manage our environment, any other number of parts of our business, it's actually not, we're not actually um, shooting ourselves in the foot in this regard. So by actually opening up to others, we can actually build stronger networks and, and we'll see opportunities come from that both within our industry and also in how we can communicate with the consumer also. So I guess um, my recommendations out of out of this whole process were, were that really it's a it's a holistic approach to to how we manage our soil. It's um, obviously it's a, I think it's pores are the crucial factor in it in the sense that we need to have that framework to actually um, manage our soils and build our soils. But it's a, it's the biology that's going to have the, have the improvement across it. But again, it comes back to the way that we decide to manage our soils along the way. So it's, there's no short, sharp, fast way of managing soil. There's any number of ways you can skin the cat and how I'm managing soils in the Yarra Valley is gonna be completely different to how someone's managing in the Riverina, to how they're managing in Coonawarra or Barossa Valley. It's, what we need to be doing is, can, we need to make sure that we're still challenging the system and promoting regional champions and regional networks where we can have open, honest and um, frank discussions about what's working, what's not working and sort of getting the best outcomes that we can for, for our industry. Because if we, if we all pull together in the, in the same direction, we're actually going to be better off um, and far more sustainable in the long term. 
So I guess this is, this is something that stuck with me from, from Bob Schindelbeck at Cornell. Um, but what I, what I think that would be, that probably adds greater, greater weight to it is it's actually the fact, it's, it's the honesty in how we communicate the successes of the pioneering farmers that will really draw the skeptics to the water. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Andy, for uh, your presentation there. We'll move uh, directly into a Q&A from here. <clears throat> a quick reminder to anyone that's not familiar, if you would like to ask Andy a question, please open the Q&A part of your webinar. Type in a question and click to send. Uh, Andy will stick around for a little while to uh, answer any questions you have. So, um, yeah, please start sending them through now, if you do have any. Uh, while we're waiting, actually, no, we might move straight into a question because we've just had one arrive. Um, so I'll just read it out. It might be more of a comment, but it's from Earl, who's, who's said, thanks, uh, all good sense. We can learn from each other's mistakes and also the beneficial activities what we do with great mark and organic materials is a case in point. There are many approaches and great differences in the challenges that we face because all vineyards have different soil types and also different soil types within particular blocks. My experience is also that people in places like Cornell are very generous people. Thank you for your uh, comments there, Earl. Much appreciated. Um, did you want to make any points in regard to comments? Uh, Earl's comments there. And oh, I think I think Earl probably sums it up a hell of a lot quicker than what I did. But, but um, no, look, I mean, and this is the thing: it's just uh, we just need to get better at talking with each other. And I, I think that's in all aspects of of business and and soil management. Yeah, you never, you never know where the answer is coming from. <clears throat> Sure, I think that's a very good attitude. Um, let's, we'll wait around for a little bit longer to see if any further questions come through. And while we do, I just want to remind uh, our audience that we do have a webinar next week. Um, same time, same day, and the topic for that session is, um, it's a powdery, a new powdery mildew app. So it's a new digital tool to facilitate in-field assessment of powdery mildew. Um, the speaker for that session will be Professor Eileen Scott from the University of Adelaide. So if you'd like to register for that session, please jump onto the AWRI website. Uh, we don't have any other questions, Andy, at this stage. So um, might hand it back to you just quickly. Did you want to make any final comments or leave our audience with anything before we start to wrap up? No, I think, uh, I think, I think that's right. I think I've uh, said what we need. Otherwise just, yeah, I think we just need to be, to be open to, um, to whatever's out there really. Okay. Fantastic. Thanks for that, Andy. Much appreciated. Um, yeah, I'd really like to thank Andy for sharing his experiences and, and for providing the content for what I hope has been a very informative session. Um, it's been fantastic to have a, an industry perspective um, on this issue. Now, I'd also like to uh, thank the audience for uh, logging in. Um, attendees will receive a follow-up email with a link to this recording. Um, as I mentioned, we do have a webinar next week. The, the details for that webinar are on your screen now. I won't go through them again. Um, that's all we have for today. Thank you again for uh, attending and I look forward to seeing you at the next AWRI webinar.